Welcome to the Pat Mayo Experience, presented by DraftKings. Remember, everyone out there, smash the like button of the episode, rate and review the audio podcast, and in the description of this video, please tell me your single favorite DraftKings tip to someone new or even someone in the intermediate beginner level that you should either do or don't do on DraftKings during NFL season, because this is the 2020 DraftKings Strategy tips and tournament selection show we're going to be talking through different strategies to employ on DraftKings this year how to select the proper tournaments and which tools you should be using as many people know right now um I am joining on to the Board of Governors with Fade the Noise that includes FTN Fantasy FTN Bets but mainly today we're talking about FTN Daily so everyone out there go to ftndaily.com and purchase the tools that we're going to be going through. We're going to be showcasing them on the show to make everything really easy for you. Optimizers, there's going to be lineup generators, there's going to be projections, easily customizable tools, which we'll showcase in the show to show you, hey, if you don't want to spend a ton of time doing this, you know, FTN Daily is probably where you want to end up going. Use the promo code MAYO and Get yourself a discount. It's all that easy. Uh, So if you're listening to the audio version of the show, I'm going to put the link to the video in the audio version. That way, if you do want to check out the tools and see how easy it is to use, then boom, it's super easy. You just click on the link and go to that part in the time codes and just watch it. Joining me to break this all down from ftndaily.com, number one up right now, one of the premier, at least during COVID times, hot streak daily fantasy players in the world. It is my man, Javi Prelezzo. What's going on, man? Hey, what's going on, Pat? Good to be here. It's yeah. a beautiful day. I, I love it. You know? Yeah. So you have you been dominating every sport you've been doing since basically the, the pandemic started? <laughs> well, I uh, yeah, I, I, I grew into the esports world, so that was a lot of fun. And uh, now I'm addicted to that, and I'm still going with that. But uh, yeah, it's been, a, it's been quite a streak, and uh, things are going great. Can't complain at all. So we're going to really hammer down with Javi in terms of how to pick the proper tournaments for you to play in, depending on what budget that you're going in. If you're not playing, you know, 10K a week, what do you do? What tournament should you select if you actually want to win money on DraftKings? Uh, Javi is the king of that. So Kyle Murray from FTN daily.com is up here as well kyle um when you you've had a hand in a lot of these tools and providing the projections you're one of the top ranked daily fantasy players in the world this really reminds me of like i I, for years i've had you know different people on the the faces that people know from like daily fantasy the screenshots you know all of the old commercials that used to come out when fantasy first started really reminds me of like when poker first started and then it came on tv there was all these old dudes and then like five years later there was a bunch of these young dudes on tv that that's you now like you've come up and just taken daily fantasy by storm yeah i get a lot of the uh, the young jokes but you know i like being the young guy in the industry i don't mind it at all and uh it's awesome to be here Pat. I'm, I'm happy to be here talking about some of these ftn daily tools it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a great time yeah again uh promo code mayo at checkout get yourself a discount and it, that just shows that the viewers are coming to ftndaily.com so have you let's start with tournament selection Uh, I think that's the fundamental thing. I mean, for me especially, I'm a shitty DraftKings player. I just bleed money trying to win a million bucks week after week after week playing like 20 lineups that don't correlate with each other just because I like clicking on names. That's step one of things not to do on DraftKings. But I do think that tournament selection is really key because you're not a guy who plays 150 lineups into tournaments. You pick the right tournaments and then you play in said tournaments and then it gives you a better chance to win i mean it's one thing going up against 175,000 people uh which you're probably not going to win so what tournaments do you think are actually preferable to people who have a budget of let's say between like 20 and 200 bucks a week they want to put in on this yeah yeah pat so i i like to do multiple lineups but i like to do uh or like to focus on just a few lineups in the right contest so i write about this time and time again i do videos and on FTN daily talking about it. So I want to kind of dive into this, especially when looking at uh, the different tournaments. Um, this is my process every time, time in and time out. I'll load up DraftKings here. Um, we can we can talk about the NFL side of things. And when I click here, what I'm going to focus on is really the field side. So I already have it here where I focus on three to 100, or you can go three to 1,000. For me, I like to focus on a thousand to five, or sorry, a hundred to five hundred total and uh, total uh, entries here. So when I'm looking here, uh, I can see 
what I'm doing here. And then I can filter by money, let's say $10. And then this is what I focus on. And this is the key in, in contest selection. So I'm going to focus on the Sunday slate and then just build my bankroll going this route. You know, there's a $10 double up. You can work on a $9, $9 tournament. That's one that's a little bigger than that. But I'm looking at the tournament sizes. I'm looking at focusing on those tournaments that are smaller in size and then building multiple lineups. I'm not going to use the same lineup in all these tournaments. So like this $9 tournament here, I like to focus on that and then build a lineup and focus on, you know, the different focuses I'm in my core plays on FTN daily or from Kyle's projections here. And then from there, I can go to another lineup, a $10 single entry, a hundred um, total people. Uh, a lot of times it's going to be single entry for these smaller contests. And I'm not going to use the same lineup, Pat. I'm going to focus on different lineups for this, just the same kind of core plays. So when you mention core plays and trying to put in different lineups, so let's say like if you were to play, I don't know, five of these tournaments, so they'd be five different lineups. Would there be any one of those players that would appear in your lineup all five times? And would all of those for NFL purposes be a stack of some sort? Yeah, so I, I like to stack in NFL um, or, or in any sport for for that case. And, and what I'm going to do is I, I like to hedge. So I, I don't like to put in every lineup, no matter you know how good the value is. I don't want to put them in all five lineups. If it's somebody that's you know filling in for a running back that's out and he's super cheap, let's say min salary, I'll probably run four or five in him just to hedge it, just in case because you never know. Especially in NFL, there can be an injury. Um, so you want to just cover your grounds from that standpoint. Uh, Kyle, going to you, when you think about tournament selection, you tend to play more multiple lineups, mass multi entering. Uh, obviously, most people aren't going to play 150 lineups in a tournament, but they might max out a 20 max, something like that when it goes down to it. What advice would you have to those people in either picking tournaments or even creating a core of players? So one big thing for uh, NFL MMing or, you know, 20 max, whatever that may be, one big thing for me is developing a core. So obviously I would go to, you know, my positional breakdown stuff and I would develop a core, you know, whatever amount of quarterbacks, receivers, running backs I want to use. One sport that I do it a lot with uh, on, on FTN daily is, is PGA. I'll, I'll break down golfers that I'm going to be using in particular price ranges and that way I'll have a pool. And from that pool, I'll construct a core. So, for example, I'll have maybe one quarterback in, in the core. Obviously, you're going to want to be utilizing multiple stacks. So, obviously, you can't run one quarterback in all of your lineups. But developing a core is crucial to kind of give those larger builds, those 20 lineups, those 150 lineups, more of your personal touch. So, that way, you have some conviction in those builds. Otherwise, it kind of feels like you're just throwing stuff at the wall, hoping that it sticks. So, developing a core is huge for, for those kind of MMEs or 20 max builds that you guys are building. So if you were to play 20 lineups in one of these 20 max, and that that's one of the contests that I've always tried to recommend to people who are playing lower limits and don't want to get overwhelmed by people putting in 150 entries. Like even if you're playing in the Millionaire Maker, there's people that are going to max enter that every single week. Now, if it was easy to win just playing 150 lineups, people would go to the bank, take out a loan, and just play 150 <laughs> lineups and win a million dollars. It doesn't actually work like that. You're going to have some yeah. very big losses trying to do that strategy. Now, if you hit big, you hit big. That's great. That's what you're playing for. But you should really never put in more money than you can afford to lose. This is, but for me, it's all entertainment. I'm not a pro like you guys are. Uh, so I'm trying to access this from you know how people like me would end up playing this. So a 20 max, whether it's a $3, a $5, a $2, a $10, the $9 slant, like Javi talked about, which I think is 150 But let's just talk about 20 for a second. But So for 20 lineups, Kyle... When you think about like quarterback stacks or game stacks that you want to utilize, what do you think the distribution is there? I know this can be dependent on week to week and the values that go ahead, but like, would you use two stacks across 20 lines? Would you use three? What do you think you're looking for there? Yeah, I would say it's obviously going to vary. There's going to be weeks where, you know, I really like one guy, so I'll probably be at a lower number, maybe one to three. But typically, I would probably say uh, four to five different stacks. And the reason why people might, you know, wonder why it's, it seems kind of low, obviously, you have 20 lineups, four to five different stacks is there's so many different ways you can go throughout those stacks. And part of having a core is narrowing down those those paths that your lineups can take. So if you have four to five different stacks, sure, you might have three different lineups with the same, let's say, Atlanta stack, but those other ancillary pieces around it in the flex or the, the opposing guy that you're bringing it back with a different wide receiver. You know, maybe you go Ridley over Julio uh, taking different paths in those builds is going to allow you to kind of diversify in those builds. So that's one thing I try to keep it as small as I can, but I also am cautious of keeping it too small because I do want to include the guys that I like, but uh, you have to kind of 
toe that line and figure out the, the perfect number because you do want to be able to cover all the different uh, options with those stacks, but you also want to expose yourself to the, the, the places that you like on that slate. Uh, Javi, when it comes to stacking players, uh, do you usually try to do the triple where it would be like a quarterback, a receiver, a tight end, or two tight end or two receivers or potentially a pass catching running back? And would you run that back with someone on the other side of the ball to kind of narrow down that, hey, this is the game that I want to target. I want to get as much exposure into it as possible. Yeah, so I would do that. And so let's say I'm doing five lineups, Pat. I, I would probably run about half that strategy in there where it's kind of like a quote unquote game stack. So for me, I'm, I'm, I'm all about that where you can have, you know, wide receiver and tight end running back with the opposing team. Cause in order for it to be optimal, it needs to be a close game. So I'm, I'm okay with running that strategy, but in the other half, I usually run the, the normal quarterback with one receiver or even two receivers to be different. Okay. So yeah, I, I kind of like that strategy a little bit. So Kyle, when you're splicing in the players that, who are not a part of your stack, but are still a part of your core, like, let's say you like the Atlanta stack for week one and you know, you want to go Julio Ridley and Matt Ryan, or you take out Ridley and you put in Hayden Hurst, however, may, whatever way you want to go with that. When you're filling out the rest of your lineup, whether it be with value players or defenses or anything like that, do you try to keep the same ancillary pieces in them? Or do you have a separate core of players that are outside of the stack that you kind of mix and match with? Yeah, typically, you know, in an ideal world, I'll have a core stack and there I'll be able to kind of shift out those pieces around the stack. Um, sometimes I will have core one-off plays, like maybe I will really like a receiver, but don't necessarily want to stack it. Um, typically, you're not really stacking uh, running backs too often. You can do that, stack a running back with a quarterback, but um, typically a running back is probably more likely to be a core outside of a stack. So um, probably looking to shift around those pieces outside of a core stack rather than shift core stacks around a core player, if that makes sense. Uh, Javi, when you're playing in these smaller tournaments at even elevated prices, like let's say I didn't want to play 10, to 10 lineups in a $10 tournament with a 20 max entry, if that contest exists, I just want to play one in a single entry. How does my mind sh mindset shift into just constructing one lineup? Or whether it's, a, do I just lean towards more of a quote unquote safe cash game lineup? And hopefully that ends up coming through and that way I can finish up in the money. Or do you still have like a GPP mentality when it comes down to it? Yes. Yeah, so so I, I love to run uh, a cash lineup in those lower contest sizes. So like if it's a single entry, a hundred person contest, a lot of times a cash lineup could cash there. So I, I love to run that mentality. For me, I, I have a core four or 66, I like to call. And uh, I, I'll be running that lineup definitely in, in a single entry contest where I focus on the core plays and, and kind of echoing what Kyle said, you know, focusing those core players in that contest. And, and I love to you know, people want to put a GPP mentality on that, but if it's a, um, you know, less people in the contest, you, you want to run a cash lineup. It's the safest bet and more times than not, it'll cash. So I, I like that mentality a lot. Yeah. So is this like a circumstance where people try to get a bit too tricky thinking like, Hey, this isn't a cash game. This is a GPP. I'm going to have like four low owned guys that no one's going to use when you should probably just be running up the chalk. <laughs> oh yeah. A hundred percent. Because uh, again, and it's, it's not a cash game per se, but it's close enough where you can run it with that. And people just try to get too cute and they, they try to do three or four, um, you know, GPP plays, but you no, know, go the safe route. Um, if you want to go one or two low owned GPPs, that's perfect. And that's what usually what I do. And it works out perfectly. Yeah. So you have your main core stack and like, do you worry about ownership all that much going into it or just try to diversify a little bit, like be aware of what the ownership percentage are likely going to be like, this guy is going to be highly owned. That guy is going to be highly owned. You know, I can have two or three of these guys in my lineup as long as I have one or two sort of outliers that I'm committed to. But at the same time, I know the rest of the field probably isn't going to own those guys. Yeah, a hundred percent. So it's, it's always good to keep an eye on ownership so that you know where you are with the field. Um, Cause when you do the bigger contest, when you have, you know, 300, 400 people and you can max enter nine, 10 lineups and you're doing 10 different lineups, it makes a difference and, and you're going to be heading towards the GPP mentality. So a hundred percent diversify and, and know what the ownership's going to be day in and day out. Kyle, where do you stand on ownership, especially in these like bigger contests? Is it something that, you know, that you try to leverage against, or do you think that people might read a bit too much into it and let them affect them to the point where they get off the good plays onto bad plays? 
Yeah, I, I found more recently, you know, I've only been doing DFS full time for two years, but I found more recently ownership gets really out of hand really fast, uh, especially in, in sports like basketball. But it even happens in NFL, you know, Sunday news rolls around any any bit of news at all. And all of a sudden it skyrockets on one given player. So um, I, 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 tend, I tend to focus more on ownership in those larger field contests where, you know, you need. You, honestly, you need a guy that's going to be 5% to, to give you a good performance to have a chance to be up there in the million maker. That's just the nature of things. And sure, there's going to be chalk guys that hit. So I think it's mainly just finding good leverage spots. Now, I'm not saying necessarily completely fade chalk. Um, there's some chalk that I like to fade uh, as like a general rule. So for example, like a value receiver, if the if that chalk gets kind of outrageous, I'll tend to fade that. Um, and typically I'll set like markers around probably around 20% uh, for like for a value receiver, probably under uh, five or six K that's kind of when the, the alert alerts will go off in my head, I guess, about fading a potential guy there, but I'm not going to, you know, necessarily fade McCaffrey just because he's 25% owned. Uh, there's going to be chalky players in winning lineups every single week. It's just about finding good pivots elsewhere. So before we dig into how to find those pivots, I want to go back to you, Kyle, on this. Like you said, there's like general rules of thumb that you can use good chalk versus bad chalk. And that's kind of the one that I've kind of heard throughout the industry is that, you know, there like if a running back is a good running back, there are so few good running backs on a weekly basis that even if they are chalk, like you mentioned, someone like Christian McCaffrey, or even if it's the like the cheap running back that you know pops up because of injury, that's forty one hundred bucks that week on DraftKings. You, it's almost like a free square if they're going to get all the touches. Whereas the forty one hundred dollar receiver, receiver just inherently is more volatile. So would that make? good chalk probably running backs bad chalk receivers and that makes your pivot point much easier at receiver than it would at running back yep you nailed it um sometimes it'll change for running backs you know there might be a perceived free square with some people where they're they're considering all the things going into the injuries or whatever whatever it may be and they're kind of counting him as a shoe in to get all the touches and maybe that's when you pivot if you disagree with that or maybe there's a, a running back split a backfield uh, by committee back there so um, that's kind of where you want to pivot. But yeah, the volatility and the variance is just built into the receiver position. You know, they're not getting as many touches. And especially when you're talking about value receivers, you know, when a value receiver steps in, often he's not going to step into a full wide receiver one workload when oftentimes a running back who's filling in for that their starter is going to be doing that. And it kind of fits the same way for tight end. A lot of times we'll see chalky tight ends and, you know, when when a guy's under 3K, under 4K, and that ownership gets up there, that's kind of a, a spot where I'm looking to fade if possible. Uh, Javi, when you think about pivot plays and trying to find one or two guys in your lineup in order to decrease the overall ownership that you might have to try to balance it out, would receiver, tight end, potentially, like, do you ever play a chalk defense by chance? Uh, no, I, I wouldn't play a chalk defense. I, I don't boil it around that. Um, but it, it's like Kyle said, you know, for, for running back, it's not necessarily also – a lock in and you know that's where we come in with the Kalen Balaj effect uh where you know he's never good chalk there and Kyle laughs because it's true and he burned a lot of people uh, and that's where we have to see uh, you know different ways to pivot different ways to hedge and, and for me it's it's pivoting off that chalky receiver um you hit the nail on the head uh Pat with that because again you're not going to get that many touches you're not going to get that many chances as opposed to a running back where they're going to touch the ball more than more than not, unless they're Kalen Balazs. Yeah, I, I would even think that when you're one thing I'm really trying to do this year that I've always fallen into the trap of doing. Mike Leone was on the show with me a few weeks ago, and we were talking about it because this is right up my alley. Trying to find sort of the scat back receiver who's running back who's 3,700 bucks who just has no upside. Like they would have to have the 99th percentile game in order to be worth it for a GPP. But then I get sucked into them like, Oh, they could have seven catches in this game. Should I, my main strategy this year, if I'm just focusing on one, two or three lineups, like you can play in the Pat Mayo experience open every single week. That is a $15 entry, three max, no rake. You can always find it in the description of the podcast or video on a weekly basis. I'm thinking about that. It's a three max. It's 15 bucks. There's 4,000, 5,000 people in that tournament. Should I just be focusing on play good running backs and then figure the rest out later, maybe do a cheap stack at quarterback and receiver and just have my stud running backs savvy. Yeah. Uh, I think that's a, that's a good plan. Um, it's a little bigger contest size than I like Pat, but, uh, <laughs> for me, it's, it's definitely finding, um, where you can get that low owned, um, either it's running back or receiver and, and finding that leverage on the field. Leverage is, is huge in any sport that you play, uh, in football, it's just as important. So yeah, definitely trying to find that lower owned, uh, running back is, is 
definitely the way to go because more times than not, the, the chalk running back is going to be the one where you can find the most leverage. Uh, Kyle, when I'm thinking about like chalk running backs on a week to week basis, and I'm thinking about like trying to like, maybe I won't necessarily fade this guy, but I'll try to look for a pivot off of him somewhere that's right around the same price point. I still want to take the good running backs, right? Like even if it's, I always find that the, the low owned running back is going to be the good running back in the bad matchup, or at least the perceived bad matchup. Yeah, you, you nailed it. That's one of my favorite things to do is target elite running backs with elite, you know, target market shares, rushing market shares, opportunity shares in tough matches because they're always going to be low owned. So, for example, um, Dalvin Cook last year plays the Bears twice, was under 10 percent both times. One time it worked out, one time it didn't. But yeah, that's going to happen sometimes. But that's a, a great way to find leverage is targeting truly elite running backs in tough matchups because people are inherently going to be down on them. And sometimes you'll find just either mediocre or bad running backs who are in a good matchup uh, as insane chalk. So I like to target those elite guys and, and spend up at running back for guys in bad matches because it really uh, lowers their ownership a ton. Well, I think that one thing that like you said, the Dalvin Cook situation against the Bears, one time it worked out, the other time it didn't work out. I think that people don't have the proper expectations when they go in that you're not going to win every single time. Uh, and right. I feel like that's part of getting over the hump to actually being good at this, isn't it, Kyle? Like, if you know that you're not going to win every lineup that you put in, doesn't it give you a more reasonable expectation of what you, like, it gives you the confidence to make one of these moves, being like, you know, I'm not going to win every time anyway. That if I'm going to go out, I want to at least go out giving myself the best chance to have a chance to win. Wouldn't that be the proper strategy? Yeah, I mean, it's tough because Javi makes it look so easy with all, all the wins he's been getting. But yeah, you, you nailed it again. You know, tournaments, basically in GPPs and in tournaments, obviously we're chasing these big prizes. You say you're chasing a million bucks. Some people may be chasing, you know, $500 in that first place prize. But you really need to just focus on a good process because good processes will lead you to having lineups that not only will pay off and when they do pay off they'll pay off in, in bigger and better ways so you're not gonna win every time that's what tournaments are that's why they only pay out the top 20 percent and i know some people make it look easy but it's not and it's all about putting yourself in a good position to win when you do get things right and that's kind of where correlation comes into play in in football specifically you know you want to stack in lineups because you get a quarterback right you're more often than not to get maybe the receiver that, you're, that he's throwing the ball to right uh, and that goes on and on. It's kind of like a domino effect in terms of correlation. So correlation is huge for, for football and part of the things of when you have a good lineup, you know, you're not going to have a good lineup every week. But when you do, when you're you know, building good lineups, having a good process, it's going to pay off bigger for you. Yeah, that that's one thing that I'm really trying to hammer down on. Like I said, the tournament selection this year, how to properly construct and correlate my lineups that if I do hit, I'm going to hit not necessarily huge, but I'm going to win if I enter 10 lineups that week that like nine of them are going to finish in the cash. And if I have a bad week, they're probably all going to finish outside of the cash it's the strategy i've done at golf where some years it's worked out really well i've been up a bunch of money i have years like this and you know there's only so many slates you end up down a bunch of money uh you know money again that you can afford to lose but you end up down like that's just the entertainment value that i get out of it. the four days is good enough for me uh, if i win that's just a cherry on top but Javi, like you've been winning a bunch at all of these different sports but obviously you're not winning every single night at least i don't think you are i mean that would be amazing if you are how do you manage expectations going in on a slate do you prepare yourself like hey i'm good with losing all this money if i lose but if i win i want to win big yeah I a hundred percent. So it's for me, I'm, I'm expecting always to at least have one lineup to hit to, to cover my, my basis here. So focusing on, you know, the different cores that I have and then hedging where I can, uh, I can't emphasize enough, you know, hedging w whenever possible, because if you go all in on a player and he gets hurt, especially with football, it, it kind of messes you up for, for the day. So it's man managing my expectation to the point where I'm trying to hit to cover my basis and then trying to hit more to grow my bankroll even more so I can play more contests uh, and eventually win the million dollars. But, you know, with the, with the million dollar contest, everybody sees the contest and says, oh, a million dollars, let me throw in my money. But more times than not, it's not the best ROI. So focusing on growing your bankroll on those smaller contests and having your core uh, and focusing on trying to get top three, top five, where you get the biggest payout, you know, that helps you out. So that's my expectation is, is going, for, going for the gold, Pat. Yeah, all you need to do is just play one of these higher entry uh, qualifiers. And then you can qualify for the NFL DraftKings World Championships like you did in basketball. And then all of a sudden you're, you're going to have a shot at like the, all of the money in the world. <laughs> mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. And I just got, got a baseball one a few days ago. So I'm super excited about that. And I, I hope to get my first DraftKings um, football one this year. So I'm super pumped. 
Yeah, I, I've made uh, one, well, it wasn't even a live final because it happened during COVID. In my DFS DraftKings career, I did it for MMA and came like dead last. Uh, so it shows, shows you how good I am at all this stuff. So I need to be really absorbing this. I think I'm getting the getting the gist of it, though, and how I want to actually go ahead with my uh, with my DraftKings strategy so far this year for football. I'm really trying to tinker with it. Someone did point out to me, Kyle, that football, a lot like golf, you don't know if your process is working or if it's not working because there's only one slate a week where in basketball, in baseball, it's every single night if you're doing it that, you know, you can have three weeks worth of samples and be like, oh, is this working? Is this not working? Am I just running bad because of variance or am I running bad because I have bad picks and a bad strategy where throughout the course of the entire football season, you won't even get that many full slates to actually play. How do you parse that out? It's a lot like golf. Yeah, that's that's a very good point. It is very tough, you know. Obviously, a smaller sample size with only you know what 16, 17 slates a year. Um, what one thing for me, and we're gonna be able to cover this over at FTN Daily every Monday. I'm gonna be doing a, a saber stream. You know, we have saber stream integrated into our lineup right now, so I'll be doing a saber stream every single Monday. Where I'm gonna be breaking down some of my lineups, some of the stuff that we went through, and that's kind of how we're gonna be able to take a look at you know my processes, our processes as a as a community, as a group, and kind of figure out where we went wrong, if the process was wrong, or if our plays just got unlucky. Because I think just by reflecting on what those guys did and reviewing things, you can see kind of where you were wrong. And in NFL, I will say you probably have to make um, adjustments more quickly and more, I guess with assumptions rather than an NBA and in uh, MLB where you kind of have a day day to day thing where you kind of can narrow in on that process uh, quick, quicker and easier. So you kind of do have to make changes a little bit quicker in, in NFL. I, I think that's actually really important to hit on because I think this kind of translates both to DraftKings, to betting, to seasonal, like weekly fantasy football that I always think that you're better off being I mean it's always better in, on DraftKings to be too early on someone than too late on someone even if that ends up being a wrong pick at least you'd be out ahead of the curve getting the low ownership and being in first before anyone realizes what's going on but it seems like football as opposed to something like baseball or basketball where it has a giant sample size that sometimes don't you just have to roll with it Kyle if, if it's something that you see and the stats are pointing one way like if you let it have three weeks of lead and be like oh I need to see more of the sample I need to be see more of the sample by the time you jump on board, it's it's over already because it's football. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it kind of works from a, a projection standpoint, too. When when we're doing these projections, you have to kind of assume some of these guys' roles. So it kind of follows through with your own personal process, too, where you have to assume stuff and kind of, like you mentioned, kind of just jump in and hope that it works. Now, sometimes you have to understand that you've been doing things right and you've been doing them well. They've just kind of either gotten unlucky or haven't gone the, the way, so the way you want it to over the past couple of weeks. So it's kind of one thing to note where you have to understand how you've been doing in the past and understand when you need to make changes and what kind of changes you should make. Yeah, I think that accountability and just uh, having some self-awareness with that. Like, I know that both yeah. my picks and process are bad. That's why I lose. Uh, that's why I'm trying to improve that. I'm trying to improve the process. Maybe the picks can come around, become a member at uh, ftndaily.com, promo code Mayo. And, you know, I have access to these projections. I can go in and actually try to come up with some better picks than I normally do. But having like when I think about it that some people are just going to say well I got unlucky and they'll say that every single week when they lose 17 weeks in a row like having some personal accountability of what you're doing right and what you're doing wrong has to be a part of this process doesn't it of course yeah and, and the best way to do it and we have this at FTM daily is you know you can send over your line and say hey what what did I do wrong I felt like uh, you know the last five weeks I've been doing well uh, I had the process right I followed everything but there's something not uh, meshing well. So asking the experts going on there, we have a discord chat where you can talk to me. It feels like 24 seven. I um, I'm on discord more than I talk to my fiance. Um, and uh, don't tell her I said that, but for, for real, uh, just focusing on that and seeing w what you can do better. What, what, what could I have done better to cash bigger in this kind of contest? You know, what am I doing wrong? Is my process wrong? Um, so asking those questions and, and we're always available to help. I'm always available to help. So just um, don't, don't be shy. Just see what the process is. Um, see what our process is, see what you're doing and ask us how you can do better. Yeah. I think that's really important. That's why I have you guys on I'm trying to ask you as many of these questions and making my notes as we go <laughs> along here. Then I'll have to like watch it back when I do the edit for it. But 
does gambling factor into this at all? And not necessarily betting on the games, Kyle, but like when you do projections, do you include spread? Like if a team is minus 10, so they're favored by 10 points, does that favor the running back in that game? Or if the over under or the team totals are really high for one particular side of the game, does that get factored into your projections? Yeah, they do. So, you know, over under team totals spreads, they'll, they'll all be factored in. Um, one thing that I've noticed for NFL is like you mentioned, it's small sample size. And I know Vegas is the, probably the best thing in terms of prediction in sports. And there's really no questioning that, but you know, they're, they're also dealing with a small sample size. There's going to be times where we want to go against Vegas. You know, we're betting against Vegas every single day with what you're doing sports betting. So it's going to be times in DFS where we do that as well. But yeah, they, they are pretty, uh, they're pretty heavily factored into the projections, especially when, in terms of game total, I try not to allow spreads to, to factor into projections too often because I don't want uh, game scripts to influence them. And because a game script can go, go wrong really quick. So I, I think I factor in team totals more than I do the spread. Uh, Javi, if someone, if we're paying attention to the inactives at you know, 1130 a.m. Eastern time, how quick are you to adjust all of your lineups right away if something just completely breaks down? Like if we get to week one this year and all of a sudden, you know, Dalvin Cook is all fired. I don't even know if he's playing on the early slate yet, but if he is, let's say, uh, and all of a sudden he's out, just declared inactive right away. And then all of a sudden, Alexander Madison is going to be the guy in Minnesota. How quickly do you have to react to that, and what adjustment process do you make when it comes down to it? Yeah, you have to you have to make the adjustment quick. Um, again, uh, I, I would focus on getting him in in the majority of my lineups, and then kind of hedging it aside where I can focus on there. Because, like Kyle said, game script can change. You know, they could be down, and they're not going to run with Alexander Madison, so they're going to be passing. So it, it kind of messes up your lineups if you have them a hundred percent of the time or a hundred in a hundred percent of your lineup. So focusing on um, getting them in there quickly, um, just in case any other injury news happens, because you want to be ready. You want to be um, locked and loaded, you know, from two hours before until lock and making sure that you have all the right plays in there. Yeah. Kyle, does that, when you factor that into projections, I assume that's just something that like you're on top of as soon as everything comes out and like, boom, well, let's get the new process going to see who ends up being the best value plays for the week. But on, on two hands, like you have one, you have you know the injury opportunity, cheap player, especially at running back, if that ends up becoming the case. Uh, but then you also have like the questionable guys who this generally happens like weeks three, you know, through the rest of the season where there might be a running back who's like iffy to play on game day. Arian Foster used to be the king of this when he would just come into the, the week, the entire week, he'd be questionable. He would never practice, but he'd always end up playing. Brian Westbrook used to be exactly the same way. And it always feels like those guys ownership are always suppressed because so many people make their lineups on like Saturday, don't even check the inactives and they don't want to take these guys because they don't know whether they're going to be in and out. Is there any inherent leverage in those sorts of players? If you know that they're actually going to play? Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, it comes down to sometimes just taking a gut stand in terms of your core and maybe uh, one thing I like to do is, for example, it happened to George Kittle last year when he was on a, a snap count, quote unquote, and it didn't really end up happening that way and he ended up being the best tight end on the slate. So sometimes you just take those kind of stances to just ensure some leverage. Uh, one cool thing that we're going to have over FCN Daily is player raiders. So I'm going to be developing player raiders for each player, each position. And that's going to not only factor in uh, projections, but also ownership and a bunch of other different, you know, advanced stats and stuff like that. So um, that will give you more of an idea of some truly good plays. So I, I wanted to take projections one step further and develop a, a GPP metric that kind of shows me who I think the best tournament plays are. And ownership's a big factor in that player raider. So stuff like that will be factored in uh, in those player ratings over there. So the the final thing before we get to utilizing the tools and the projections, Javi, I want to ask you, how important is it, especially in NFL, like full slate, the early slate and the late slate, to utilize the late swap if anything comes up? Or if you're trailing in tournaments that and all you have left are the same guys everyone else has left, but you're already out of the money, chances are you're not going to catch up and you might just have to you know, change those to plays you don't even like because that's the only way that you can get your money back. It won't necessarily work all the time. But even if it works one out of 10 times, at least you've salvaged some of that slate. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, you definitely want to stay on top of it. Late swap is super important. Um, in fact, if you mentioned it, you know, if you had somebody that didn't do well and it's ruining your lineup, finding that leverage play, that lower owned guy as opposed to the chalkier guy could make a difference between cashing and not. So focusing on that. Um, and you can find, you know, those those sneaky guys at FTN Daily. You can ask us on Discord. You can check our our cheat sheets, our different articles, and and that can help you out. We're gonna have 
stuff all over the place showing, um, you know, who those lower owned guys are going to be and, and how you can pivot there. Yeah. Kyle, how do you factor that in? If like, if you're having a bad run on the early slate, do you try to adjust your lineups to potentially not, like I said, not necessarily come back and win a GPP, but just make sure that, Hey, I want to give myself an opportunity to get back in the cash to mitigate some of the damage. Yeah, yeah, I think that's one way that you can definitely try to catch up. Another thing I like to do is maybe uh, we have a guy that might be chalk at running back, for example, and you didn't play that guy, and you notice that maybe he's a little bit uh, higher owned than you even expected, or maybe even lower owned, and you can make assumptions based on maybe another guy in those late games and factor, and you can really make ownership uh, adjustments on the fly in those late games. And that's one thing that we're going to be talking about in the Discord on Sundays as the, as the games go on, like Javi mentioned. We're going to have a handful of people in there. Um, pretty much 24-7. You know, we have guys in the West Coast. We have nocturnal people. So we'll have people in Discord all all day and all night. So we're going to be able to talk about that stuff. And ownership and leverage and pivoting in, in the late games are, is definitely important. Uh, Javi, before we jump into the projections, do you have any just general tips for people? Like, just don't do this. Like, this, this is a terrible <laughs> idea. This is how you're going to lose money just off the hop. <laughs> yeah, I, I think the, the focus, especially with football, um, is, is to stack, you know, have a quarterback with a receiver or have a quarterback with a tight end. It's, it's the best way to get your correlation. As Kyle mentioned earlier, um, just having a quarterback there and then three random receivers that aren't in the same team and a different tight end, that's not the way to go. You want to find out, uh, you want to get the upper hand and that's the best way to get the upper hand. You know, it's, it's pretty much like double points. So, uh, finding that correlation, focusing on one guy pairing with your QB is, is ideal. Uh, Kyle, would you say that lack of correlation is also like the first thing? Just don't do that. Actually correlate your lineup. Yeah, I think even in even in cash games now, I find it so important to correlate your lineups. You, you need to stack in tournaments for sure in NFL or else you're kind of just putting yourself behind. It kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier about finding yourself just being right on things. And when you stack and correlate your lineups, you know, if you're right on one thing, you're more often to be right on, you know, maybe two or three other things. So correlation is a must have in NFL lineups for sure. Okay, yeah, well, let's, let's go to the main show here. We, we have the FTN Daily Tools. Uh, Kyle is doing a lot of the projections. So, Kyle, would you please share your screen with us and walk us through how you actually do your research, use your projections, and generate your lineups? Breaking down some of these tools that we have. So we're going to have a ton of tools over at FTN. This one right here is the Air Yards tool. Everybody loves their Air Yards. So Elliot, Chris, Stefano, a lot of our back-end guys uh, did a lot of amazing work. So this is, we have the uh, Air Yards tool. Breaking down some other NFL tools, we have pace and situations, which pace and situations is cr cr critical for uh, fantasy and NFL. You can really determine high scoring games. Uh, we'll have some cheat sheets that we can talk about in a little bit as well. But uh, let's hop right into the optimizer where, so I, like I mentioned earlier, we have Saberson uh, integrated into our FTN Daily website. And my projections for week one have been uploaded. Uh, these projections are going to uh, get a little bit more updated as we get closer. We're obviously a couple or uh, a little bit over a week out. So um, these will be updated as we get closer to that. But um, basically what I like to do for um, my, my each and every week process is I'll go position by position, kind of filter out some of these guys that I want. So uh, I'm not going to necessarily go through the entire pool, but um, you can sort by value, by projection, and kind of determine the guys that you want in that player pool or not. And we talked about narrowing down player pool and developing cores and just to, to get guys out of line. So we don't like Carson Wentz, uh, don't like Matthew Stafford. We just get those guys out of the player pool. And that way we're able to kind of refine our core, refine our player pool a bit. And obviously we have some uh, some pretty unique settings as well. So Saberson's a little bit different in terms of other optimizers. So a lot of um, lineup generators, they just generate you your best, your best projected lineup. And obviously we, we're going to think that we're going to have the best projections in the industry. Not only will my projections be integrated into the Sabersum Optimizer every week, Jeff Ratcliffe's and uh, Kevin Adams, Magic Sports Guy, his projections will be uh, uploaded each and every single week. But um, one thing to note about this is we're talking about correlation, we're talking about leverage. All that stuff is vital in terms of building good NFL lineups. And general optimizers don't factor any of that stuff in. And Sabersum is a little bit different because they do, they do factor all that in. So each and every time you build a lineup, you're going to have a Saber score. And that's going to be based off of three things correlation, ownership fades, which is also known as leverage, and then smart diversity, which is going to be talking about sample size in terms of the simulations that they run. So another unique thing about Saberson is that each lineup that they build, each uh, build of lineups is generated off of simulations. So my projections, you know, it's imported and simulations will be ran on the game to determine, you know, a ceiling and a floor and kind of a randomness setting for each and every simulation. So no other optimizer factors that stuff in. And here you can use stacking tools at whatever stacks you guys would want. Um, we talked about stacking being crucial. 
in, in NFL. So this is going to be a huge tab that we're going to be using each and every week. And I'm going to be breaking down more of this Saber Sim optimizer in my Saber streams. I'm going to be having three times a week, Monday, Thursday, and Friday. Um, so those are going to be live on, I think, Twitch, YouTube, and FTNDaily.com. So um, you can check those out to learn more about the SaberSim Optimizer. And in terms of projections, like I mentioned, we're going to have mine. You guys can use SaberSims, Jeff Ratcliffe's, and Magic Sports Guys, or you can use an average of all of them. So that's going to be pretty much it for the projections. And the SaberSim, like I mentioned, if you guys want to know more about that, uh, we'll have the Saber stream going three times a week. All right, so let's say I just wanted to go right now on Saber Sim, and I wanted to build 10 lineups pretty quickly. Um, how would I go about doing that so it's not going to take me all day to figure this out? <laughs> yeah, so another cool thing about Saber Sim is, you know, if we can organize this build based on the kind of contest that you're in. So we're talking about contest selection being vital. So we're going to say if we want 10 lineups and a 10 max, then we're going to narrow it down to, let's say we're going to be in a contest from 1,000 to 10,000 people. We want a GPP and we want 10 lineups. So we'll do that. Max exposure, we'll leave at 100 for now, but you can narrow that down if you don't want to necessarily be all in on guys. And right there, they're going to build you 10 lineups based on a the builds the, the build settings that you guys want, including the, the kind of contest that you're in, the kind of the structure of contests that you guys are in. So we set that for 20 max and contests between one and, and 1,000 people. And this will give you 10 lineups just like that. So will this also factor in the correlations that you would put in uh, when you would adjust the settings? Yeah, so this these builds will be directly impacted based on these settings that we're, we're using. So um, to run through some of these settings for correlation for NFL, I'm probably going to want this as high as possible. Um, probably 7 to 10 is kind of where I'm going to be at. I'll probably be around 9 or 10 most weeks. Um, ownership fade is going to depend on how good of chalk i think there is that week but for the most part that'll probably be in the in the three to five range and then for smart diversity i'm probably going to have that around five to seven so that lineup just got built that build is being built right now and then we'll have the 10 uh lineups and one thing to note about saber sim is that they give you a pool size of 500 so right now we have a pool size of 500 lineups and it pulls the 10 best um saber scored lineups out of that player pool and oh. it tells you what kind of stacks we have and everything all right, all right that's that's super cool so can that be a so if you have the 500 in the pool of lineups that it is simulated for you uh can you go and choose a different 10 if you want to uh so the one thing that the reason why they do this pool size is so that way you can narrow in on your exposures after the build so another thing that is different compared to traditional optimizers is they force you to do your your min and max exposures before you actually build your lineups and the reason why i don't really like that is because you have you're forced to dial in uh, on certain guys and in, in situations, and you're not really allowing the settings or the optimizer to do any work for you. So um, in a traditional optimizer, you're saying, okay, I want a minimum of 20% of this guy and a max of 50% of that guy. Here, you can go right here, say we have 70% Eckler. He's playing Cincinnati, he might be a fine play, but say 70% is a little bit high. We lower that down to 50, and then it'll, it'll take a different lineups from that pool of 500. And it will still leave you with 10 lineups, but it'll be able to adjust that max exposure instantaneously without having to run another build. And that's also clutch for Sundays because, you know, like you mentioned, an inactive could come out. Alexander Madison's now starting for Minnesota. Obviously, you'll have to run that build another time with new projections and whatnot. But you'll also, you know, be able to edit those exposures without having to run six, seven, eight, nine different builds. All right. That's cool. So uh, also on FTNDaily.com, again, promo code Mayo if you want to get in. I mean, I, I'm this is how I'm going to be building my lineups this year. So hopefully it all works. Hopefully your projections are good, Kyle. How often do the projections get updated? And when does ownership start playing a factor in this? Because, I mean, you can put in ownership projections right now as we talk. You know, we're still more than a week out from the season. Probably going to be kind of useless. So when does yeah. ownership actually develop itself to be somewhat useful? Yeah, so obviously ownership is going to be refined as the day goes. I'm going to make it a point to have ownership and projections up by Wednesday morning of each week. Um, they'll probably be up earlier on some weeks where we can get a bump on Tuesday. Um, but I do want them to be as accurate as possible. So we'll probably do a uh, shoot for Wednesday and then I'll update it. I pretty much live in Excel. I don't ever close my Excel sheet. So I'll probably update it uh, as soon as I can every time I make any kind of adjustment. Um, so that's one thing to note. It'll be finalized by Saturday night and, and Friday night. And I'll keep continue to update them up until the game's lock. And yeah, ownership, it's going to, you know, we'll have that first run out Wednesday, but it's going to continue to update. Obviously, Thursday injury reports will happen and ownership will change based on that. And Sundays will roll around. Ownerships will constantly be updating. So I would say check for those first initial projections on Wednesdays and then check back Friday or Saturday for those those more final numbers. And then 
don't be afraid to, uh, or don't be, or make sure you're checking back on Sunday for the, for the final numbers. Uh, you were uh, showing off the, uh, you, you kind of clicked on it on the tab and I was, I got super curious cause I hadn't clicked on it yet with the pace tools and trying yeah. to find up tempo type games. Can you walk us through that a little bit and kind of explain how that's really valuable information to have when constructing DraftKings lineups? Yeah, so one thing to note is we, we've seen a lot of different offenses changing. And so this is going to be based off of last year's numbers. Obviously, we don't have any 2020 data yet. So it's based off last year. So some things do change. So that's one thing to note. But the first thing I like to do is check out the seconds per snap. So last year, the Browns were actually number one in pace in terms of seconds per snap, which, you know, you wouldn't really expect. They're a run-heavy team. And this is basically just saying that they're getting to the line as quick as they possibly can and running those, those plays quicker with with less time running off the clock and that's good for for fantasy purposes we want as many plays as we can and we want as much time kind of left on the clock while plays can be ran so um, obviously the the total expectation for pace is snaps so total uh, snaps led was the houston texans and that is a way to kind of determine which teams are going to be in high pace spots so when you can find let's say the texans might be playing the browns one week it's going to be a very fast paced game and it's going to probably going to lead to a good uh, environment for fantasy scoring. You can also check out our trends for the last four weeks. Um, and then you can go over to our situational stuff. And if you are curious on kind of somebody's or a team's run numbers or pass numbers in the red zone, you can do that. You can look at their run numbers and their pass percentages when they're up by 15 to 20. And you can do that pretty much all throughout the score here. This is the uh, 20 to 15 yard line. Sorry. Winning by more than eight, winning by less than eight, losing by eight. Uh, and stuff like that. So you can really find situations. So say you are in a spot where you think a running back is going to be in a game where they're going to be trailing. So you want to see how that he's going to be affected. Maybe we want to target a team that's going to continue to run the ball, even when they're down by eight or more. So that's one thing you can use the situational tool here. All right. I really like that. Uh, is there any more tools you want to kind of showcase to us right now to show the viewers of what they can get if they go to ftndaily.com? Yeah, um, one thing that we can pull up, we don't have anything up for NFL yet. Obviously, we're still a little over a week out, but is our cheat sheet. So basically, we have all of these pros here, all these DFS professionals. We have um, multiple, we have, I think we have two different Millie Maker winners between Drew Matthews and Two Gun who are doing their cheat sheets or their exposures for each and, sport. And, and Two Gun has won three of the millionaire winners. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I don't want to sell him short. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> we have these cheat sheets here that will be developed. And basically, you can go to each person say you want to check out magic sports guys plays for the week quarterback running back wide receiver tight end and his exposures for that given week will be directly inputted for you guys there um, my screen looks a little bit different because i am uh, fancy and i have admin mode but um, <laughs> basically what, what the the point of this is we're going to have exposures we're giving you guys kind of the keys to the castle showing you what guys are on maybe what guys were a little bit lower on you'll be able to see our exact exposures that we have for key players on that slate I think that's really important. And again, that goes back to the accountability for doing something like this. You know whose picks will not be included in that? Pat Mayo's, because I'm fucking terrible. And I might just end up doing what I always do and just like mass enter 20 lineups with five minutes to go because I'm trying to kill five minutes. Javi, I would think that is probably something uh, that we're not going to be doing uh, in terms of tips and tricks. Don't just enter lineups because you're bored. Yeah, no, 100%. I, I would say... Uh, Find the right contest and, and, you know, that's the best way to grow your bankroll. If it's cash games, it's, it's also a, a good way, you know, you're going to double your money at best, but I like to, to go for the tournaments, uh, the smaller contest sizes and focus on that. You know, you can run a cash game there and win even more. All right. Uh, any final thoughts from you guys? It sounds like everything's going well. Uh, I know that the team over at FDN Daily is, you know, they're coming into the season hot. Hopefully the NFL season can remain just as hot. Some, some white hot fire. Get some people some million bucks. Get some people to the DraftKings World Championships. That would be great. What are your expectations for this season, Javi? And what are you most excited about for the site? Oh, I, I'm most excited to see, um, you know, all the, I, I'm a guy that, you know, I love to win, but I love to see others win. So I'm excited to see uh, how our subs do um, using every, you know, all our core plays, all our projections, our cheat sheet exposures. So just seeing um, how everybody does, you know, using the best in the industry, which is FTN, um, you know, FTN daily, FTN fantasy, FTN bets, the works here. So uh, I'm excited to see um, everybody win. I expect a, a million maker from, you know, one of our subs or one of us. Um, oh, uh, you, I got you, close you're, last you're, year. You're setting the bar pretty high there, Heavy. I'm not going <laughs> to lie to you. Yeah. I, well, I got close last year. You know, I got third place. It was, uh, I was a Dallas Goddard catch away from, from getting the million. Uh, 
I, I, I hope to get there one day, Pat, but I would love it if somebody in our family wins it as well. It, it, it makes me just as happy. Uh, Kyle, what are your expectations for the season, both using the tools and just for you personally? Yeah, a big a big thing for us at FGN is like Hobby mentioned, we want to see those our subscribers succeed. So a big thing is, you know, we we all want to do well, but we want to teach people how to do well too. We don't want to just throw picks in their face and hope that they get they get the picks right. We want to teach guys to kind of develop their own process, teach people how to kind of find their own way as well. So we want to be a, more of a community, not necessarily just throwing out articles and picks and all that stuff. So we want to provide tools, analysis, projections, everything that we possibly can. And so I guess our our main goal is just to be the best in the industry and continue to put out a ton of good content and grow an awesome community. All right, guys. Thank you for joining me on the 2020 DraftKings NFL strategy show. Once again, ftndaily.com. Use code Mayo and get yourself a discount on all the tools, the projections, and the cheat sheets. And there's you know, every other sport that's up there too. So you can kind of find out where you're at. Oh, last thing, Kyle, you were talking about the pace tools and showing those off and trying to find the high pace games, which could lead to higher totals. That would be great for like betting over-unders too, wouldn't it? Yeah, definitely. That that We're going to have multiple tools. We actually have some tools in the work that are going to be developed and released as the season goes. But yeah, that's one way to determine fantasy output, good fantasy environments, and over-unders for sure. All right. The only final tip that I will give to the audience, because it's like the only thing that I'm good at, is finding cheap defenses to play. And it's better from like week five on once we have a sample of what's going on. But essentially, you want to be playing defenses that get immense pressure on the quarterback, so like sack rate or pressure rate, versus a team that's just going to throw a lot. It doesn't matter if it's a good defense or a bad defense or a good quarterback or a bad quarterback. The amount of pressures that you can get on a quarterback who is passing in volume will directly correlate to DraftKings defense scoring. You don't need to take the team that's going to try to win 10 0. Uh, you want to even have the team that you know might be putting up points on the other side, but if that team is going to be throwing the entire time, you get sack points, you get fumble points, and potentially you get sack fumble touchdown or pick six points, and then you've broken the slate with a really crappy defense. So that is my one tip that I will actually give you that is good advice. <laughs> the rest of my advice, not so good. Remember to smash the like button for the video and in the comment section please give me your best tip for DraftKings going into the 2020 NFL season rate and review the Pat Mayo Experience audio podcast five stars on Apple Podcasts leave a review if you like it as well and of course ftndaily.com promo code Mayo to get access to all these tools uh, and as Kyle just did with the walkthrough with you and as Happy did with the tournament selection hopefully you can put a lot of this to good use develop your own process learn from it uh, and like they said you don't need to take their picks you just develop your process process building off what they do uh, and then you can go win yourself a lot of cash on DraftKings too so process over results but make sure that your process is all right uh, we will be back with week one picks at some point during a closer to actual kickoff but hopefully this was a good teaser for you to get ready for the DraftKings season I'm Pat Mayo thank you for watching I'll see you next time Experience. Experience.